Good morning, Hacksters. It is my favorite day of the week. It's Tuesday. We have Hackster Cafe. And this week we have Mitch Altman, legend, awesome person. I admire you so much in so many different ways. Hello, Mitch. How are you? I'm doing great. Yeah, I'm, uh, <clears throat> I now live in Berlin, so uh, it's cold here, that's the scarf, and uh, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, but uh, things things are doing well here. <laughs> it sounds like it's agreeing with you. Um, so, oh my god, my brain has just frozen. Oh, yeah, so you are actually our last live interview of the year, uh, and um, it's wonderful to have you on, uh, and you have a new... Well, it's not a new kit, but uh, there's one in particular that you were talking about uh, trying to move recently, and I've never built it, but it sounds really cool. Can you tell us what is the Ardu Touch? Yeah. And maybe, actually, true. sorry, tell us a little bit about yourself first so people know uh, if they're not already familiar, which many people are. Sure. <clears throat> yeah, so um, I've been uh, playing with electronics all my life, and somehow I became internet famous when I uh, invented this keychain that turns TVs off in public places called TV Be Gone. And that was uh, in 2004. So um, <laughs> there it is. And uh, that's how I've made a living for the last 18 years. Me and 12 friends have made a living on this totally cool, wow. bizarre project. And uh, but I've, I've done things I think are pretty cool throughout the decades of my life. I've been alive for, I guess, quite a while now. So, um, yeah, in the 80s, I, I helped develop virtual reality and made it uh, virtual reality a reality. What? And, um, <laughs> yeah, that was with a company called VPL that. Research. We thought we were making a visual programming language, <laughs> but that's huh. why the name of the company was VPL yeah. Research. But uh, the technology back then in 1986 wasn't good enough for that, but the input-output devices that we created turned into virtual reality uh, by accident. So, um, yeah, and the guy who started the company, Jaron Lanier, came up with the phrase virtual reality because I was calling it alternate reality generator, and that's just too much of a mouthful. <laughs> so, well, that's so funny because now we have alternate reality games and uh which is a whole other thing but um you also directed me to your wikipedia page which mm -hmm. i have actually never read through either but if folks you want to get a better uh idea of who mitch altman is he's a legend you've also so you've created the tv be gone which it, um many many people have learned how to solder with this you've also run lots and lots of learn to solder workshops around the world for decades mm -hmm. uh, and this is how a lot of people actually know you can you tell us a bit about that yeah, so in 2007, I, uh, with the help of a bunch of cool people, started an early hacker space in the United States called Noise Bridge. And, yeah! Uh, yeah, and that, that was an example for lots of other people to be inspired to start hacker spaces, which was very gratifying and unexpected. But um, yeah, and, uh, and that's how we met back, you know, I visited uh, AHA, All Hands mm -hmm. Active in, in Ann Arbor, and there you were. <laughs> So we've known each other ever since. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, but there I I was doing all sorts of things that I love doing, including teaching how to solder. Um, that's how they pronounce it in, in Europe. Uh, <laughs> yeah. there, there's an L in it. And um, although here in, in, uh, in Deutschland, it is Luten. Um, and my does that, German have, does that mean like to lead it or something? Using lead? Uh, Blei. Blei. Oh. Oh, never mind then. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know where Luton comes from, but uh, it's it's a fun word to try to pronounce if you have an American mouth. But ah. um, yeah, but anyways, uh, at, at Noisebridge, I started teaching people how to solder, and um, yeah, and and then when I was invited to give talks, and I was invited to give talks all over the world for big and small events, and I would uh, find hacker spaces and say, hey. Uh, you don't know me, but I'd love to teach people to solder there. And um, people usually, well, pretty much always said, yeah, sure, let's try it. And yeah. it became popular. And I developed the TV Be Gone kit to teach people how to do that. And it became more popular. And so since then, I've been, until <laughs> the pandemic, of course, traveling all over the world, uh, giving workshops, teaching people how to solder with all sorts of kits. And I've developed a whole bunch of kits that are fun and intriguing or whatever <laughs> cool yeah. for people to learn with all these other different ones uh, this new i can solder badge how new is this i haven't seen this before 
that's like um, maybe a couple of years old. And that one's super, super simple. It's got a, a, a color blinky light that with the switch, you can turn it on. And then it's got sort of a white flashlight just with a push button. Oh. You can, and it says I can solder because after you solder it together, then of course you can. <laughs> this is a prime candidate for something that I was wanting to do a while ago, which is turn like, um, you know, we get so many cool PCB badges. And uh, one thing I want to use them for is bike lights. And this is perfect for that. Mm. It's got both like a, a little flashlight and a little blinky red light. You could put it on the back of your bike and, and people could see you. At night. Yeah, it'd be probably good to put on your helmet and make you more visible. Yeah. And uh, and put lots of LEDs on your bike. That, that's really Oh, yes. Cute. LEDs <laughs> are, are always good to have. Yeah, especially on bikes. I used to run these bike lights workshops at Noise Bridge. It, yeah. It's incredible. It just it just keeps coming around. So we got off to a bit of a chaotic start uh, on my <laughs> part. But uh, let's take a look at this Ardu Touch kit that you were talking about. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, so that's my latest kit, although I've been working on it now for over five years. Um, but I've always made, uh, well, since, since I was a little kid, I've been making music synthesizers, originally um, analog ones. Mm. And analog ones, I still love analog the best, but uh, but digital is so much easier and it has so fewer parts and so <laughs> less expensive and you can do so many cool things with it. So um, I wanted to make a, a kit that's very inexpensive that people can learn to solder with and can use as a performing musical instrument as well. So this one, it's called Ardu Touch because you know, in the picture there, the upper left corner with the chip mm -hmm. and that connector, uh, that's an Arduino built into the board that I designed there, the blue board I designed. And, uh, and down below, that looks kind of like a stylophone keyboard because of my stylophone. Oh, I should cool. get some stylophone. And so it's a touch keyboard. So Ardu, Arduino, touch, Ardu touch. And then it's also got a built-in little speaker and amp. That's not like super high quality, but it's enough so that after you solder it together, you just put the batteries in and turn it on and it works. And it makes really nice, thick sound. And the synthesizer that it comes pre-programmed with is called Thick. And huh? that's four sawtooth waves, if that's meaningful for you, you music people, uh, synthesizer people, it's really nice sound. And, uh, and then you can reprogram it with different synthesizers. And we have 10 of them at the moment and ah. more coming. And you can just use the Arduino software, the free Arduino software to reprogram it. Oh, I'm very interested in that. Uh, and are these linked on this GitHub that you have here? Yeah, yeah, everything's there. That's all, it's totally open source, like everything I do. Um, so the, uh, I designed that one in Eagle. Uh, I, I now do everything in KiCad. Yeah. And I, I will do uh, a keycap because I love the open source tools and it's very yeah. powerful. And uh, so the next one will be uh, in KiCad. And uh, so the design files are there for Eagle and all of the um, software and a lot of documentation. And you can learn about digital signal processing if you read through my documentation. I also cool. have some talks online for uh, about that as well. And the assembly instructions are super, super nice. I, I put a lot of time and effort into that. So anyone can learn to solder with it and also learn how to make your own music synthesizer. And you recently gave a workshop about that, right? Uh, oop, not there. Yeah. Yeah. There, are a lot. there are a lot of demo uh, videos that show the sounds. Mm. So yeah, on um, uh, IEEE, I wrote a, an article for IEEE magazine on oh. digital signal processing um, using the RG Touch as an example. And then IEEE asked me to give a talk online uh, like about a month ago. So I did that. And that was Jeez. for beginners to learn the basics of digital signal processing, even if you know nothing at all about it to begin with. So it was fun. Awesome. Is that, ah, I'm trying to close this. Thing on the IEEE website, <laughs> but um, is that this? How? Yeah, so there's the article. Cool. Yeah. Oh, it's in third person because <laughs> it's an article. Excellent. I am going to read this later. Uh, we'll put the link to this in the description to the video. Of course, everyone who's watching now, um, everything that we pull up here, pretty much you'll be able to find in the description to the video later on so that you can pursue it at your leisure. Um, 
tell us about some of the other kits that you've created because we've got the Ardu Touch. You talked about the TV Be Gone, um, and I know that there's some other things like this is this doesn't come in a kit exactly, but the Neuro Dreamer is a very special piece of technology. And I'm yeah. eternally grateful to you for giving me one. <laughs> oh, I'm glad it's helpful for you. Yeah, that one's kind of a, a strange project, but um, it's helped a lot of people. Uh, you know, I, I've been um, uh, fascinated with consciousness ever since I was a little kid and able to think about thinking, you know, it's kind mm. of a weird thing that we can think about existing and thinking and all that. But uh, as an undergrad, I took a lot of physiology of psych classes. Huh. And that got me interested in, um, you know, to try to figure out, you know, like no one knows what consciousness is. We all believe we have it and it seems we really do. But what does it mean? No one's really defined it. And it has something to do with being aware and something to do with life and something to do with thinking and, mm. and lots to do with our brain. But is it only this stuff? Nobody knows. So uh -huh. um, but it got me interested in brain waves, And I, I made myself a guinea pig for lots of grad students studying brain waves when I was an undergrad. And I saw that I can control my brain waves because I'd been meditating since I was a little kid, uh, 13 years old. <clears throat> and uh, that's kind of weird for Americans. But when I went to India the first time, I, I, I was hanging out at an ashram with a bunch of people learning yoga. And these little kids came along and they've been meditating for years and they were only six. So um, anyways, I've been meditating since I was 13. So I wanted to see, I didn't tell the grad students till afterwards, but I was hooked up with all these electrodes on my brain, on my head. And, um, and I started meditating and they said, oh, we got to stop the experiment. Your, your uh, alpha waves are blotting out all the other measures. Uh, <laughs> wow, power so move. I guess it worked. And uh, yeah, so one day while meditating, uh, several years ago, I came up with the idea. It's like, well, we know how to measure brain waves. Well, is there a way to play brain waves back? Mm. And so I, I was like, well, you know, putting electrodes in your brain, that's kind of invasive. And I'm not really into doing that. Uh, I'm not Elon Musk. Well, Elon Musk doesn't want to do it to himself. He just wants yeah. other people to do it to themselves. And Nothing suspect the there. Yeah, no, I want him to do it on himself. And I also <laughs> want him to go to Mars. <laughs> but anyways, that's that's sort of my opinion. Yeah. It's, uh, anyways, um, uh, yeah. So I thought, um, you know, blinking lights can lights can blink at brainwave frequencies because it's all less mm. than hundred hertz, and um, and I can pulse sound at brainwave frequencies as well. So since I've been meditating, I recorded my meditation and then simplified it to a nice model that I could put in sound and light. And then I called that a brain machine and anyone wearing it um, can sort of follow along to a nice 15 minute meditation. And it turns out that um, there's been research on this. I didn't know that when I came up with the idea, but people have been playing back brain waves for as long as they've been recording him huh. since the 1920s. And how have they been play, like playing them back into the human brain as a system? Or yeah, so in the 1920s, late 1920s, the guy, uh, um, what's his name, uh, Gray Walters, um, oh. he uh, is the first person to record brainwaves from a human, or at least recorded uh, in his in history for doing that, and uh, he wanted to play them back to get sort of a base level. So what he would do is take a strobe light, xenon strobe light, wow. and link them at alpha wave frequencies, which is like 13 hertz, and saw that people, 80% of people in his experience would would um, follow along and get into kind of a spacey state, which is what wow. happens with alpha waves. And um, yeah, and there's been some research, not a whole lot, uh, with double blind studies and all this kind of stuff, which show that it, it, it followed through like 80% or so of people will follow along with brainwaves presented in uh, light and sound. Mm. So, and then you, you actually experience, you know, like when, when you go from awake and maybe a little bit anxious and then start meditating, spacing out and then going into a deep kind of like, whoa, this is cool. I'm spacing out uh, kind of trance. Then um, um, 
your brain waves change and you can measure that. And it's um, pretty much the same for everybody uh, in, a, in a big sense, uh, overall sense. And if you play that back, then about 80% of people, if they want to, will follow along and then they'll learn to meditate that way if they've had trouble doing it totally on their own. Mm. There's an interesting technical side note here, which is that you can play back flashing lights at a certain frequency that we can see. But when you do it with audio, it's actually too low for us to perceive because the lower threshold for human hearing is about 200 hertz. So there's this interesting phenomenon called binaural beats that I'm sure you, you already know about. But like for those following along, it's a very interesting phenomenon where you can combine two different frequencies. You play one frequency over here that's like, you know, uh, 205 hertz and 210 hertz over here and you hear a pulse it's like the difference between the two so a five hertz pulse if you're trying to induce that and your brain puts them together inside of your head when you're hearing these like one frequency in each ear and you uh, are able to entrain your brain waves that way it's so fascinating ah. it is really cool and that's exactly what i do with the brain machine and also with ah. the neurodreamer sleep mask uh -huh. so to get those low frequencies um, you can't really hear five hertz, but you can hear a five hertz pulsing, throbbing kind of a thing. And then your brain is involved with perceptually creating that five hertz. And so it makes it more powerful to follow along with. And, uh, you know, it's purely perceptual. If you do it like uh, on a on a guitar, so um, mm. you know, like there's a guitar there. If I have two strings with frequencies that are close together, and this is how people usually tune a guitar, yeah, um, you hear the kind of wow, 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 and you make that that wowing sound uh, as slow as possible until it stops, and now you know you have two strings that are the same note. Um, so doing that with binaural beats with uh, a microcontroller. Uh, so we perceive that sound makes it more powerful to follow along. <clears throat> and the NeuroDreamer sleep mask. Oh, yeah. And I made a kit of the brain machine. That's what started all of this. So uh, uh, with the um, uh, with the NeuroDreamer sleep mask, that was created to help people sleep mm. as well as a version to help people meditate. And that one cool. is uh, very gentle and it uses a thing called pulse width modulation, oh, yeah. which is uh, a way to make a variable amount of energy come out of uh, a computer because computers are normally just on or off and that's it. Mm. But we can make square waves that are going on, off, on, off, on, off, but we can change the amount of on versus the amount of off. So, uh, uh, so if I have on and off varying, <laughs> <laughs> um, over time, and it, uh, I can make that create any kind of waveform that I like. Yeah, and I talk about that in my. On and... Yeah, I, I have a talk online with that tr IEEE thing, and also mm. at Hope and EMF Camp, and talk about that if you're interested. Oh yeah, and just so that people have visuals, here's the NeuroDreamer sleep mask that um, she's talking about, and also uh, this thing that you use in your avatars on various platforms. This is the brain machine. Yeah. Got to get a visual on that because it's an incredible piece of, of uh, a project. Yeah, I wrote it up for Make Magazine. It was for Make Magazine number 10 in the early <laughs> days of Make Magazine. Back in the day. And Make Your Fair. And a lot of people made that. And one of the things that uh, I, what motivated me to make that was I wanted to have a cool project that would uh, make people want to solder even if they've never done it before mm. and uh, I also wanted people to try meditation since that helped me so much in my life and learning to live with all sorts of uh, <laughs> things that were difficult in my childhood that I still carry mm. uh, but you know through meditation I learned to live with it all and learned to live a life I love living and I love sharing that but one of the things that was a big draw for the brain machine is that um, not only do you follow along and meditate, but you hallucinate beautiful colors and patterns along the way. And a lot of people seem to like hallucinating. So uh, that's <laughs> a big draw. Yeah, we have a couple of questions here before we move on. Uh, to answer Lionel, I believe, yes, it is your brain making up the five hertz sound. Yeah, no? 
Yeah, yeah, your brain makes it up. With If you do it on the guitar, like I was pointing out, oh, the side <laughs> mirror, uh, <laughs> then it's a physical phenomenon. But if you play one frequency here and another frequency here that's five hertz difference, then your brain perceives the five hertz. And it's purely perceptual, not physical. And so no one no one really knows what is going on there. But it, <laughs> it, and not everyone experiences that, but like about 80 percent. Really? I did not realize that it was a not an everyone thing. Ah. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a question from Aaron, Ro Aaron Robot Girl, and this is actually something we touched on uh just when catching up, and you've been mentioning that uh you missed doing in-person workshops. And can you tell us a bit about your experience. Oh, I so miss that. <clears throat> I've had a few over the last since summer, because uh, there there was a, a really wonderful small hacker conference in hackerspace Ghent, mm. and I, uh, me and other people did some actual real live in person workshops for the first time in a long time. But uh, other than that, through the pandemic, we're you know, online is not a replacement for life, but we're really lucky to have this technology. Uh, through the pandemic to at least have some sense of connection with each mm. other. And I've been doing online talks and workshops throughout the pandemic. And that's been really fun. And I, I love sharing it that way too. But doing it in person is just so much cooler. <laughs> yeah. Are there any tips that you would have for running online workshops to make them feel more personal or to make them work better? Because it's I imagine it's a lot easier when you can actually like walk around and look at what people are doing, but maybe people don't have like another camera to point at things. Or... Yeah, well, I have multiple cameras, which helps. Mm -hmm. um, so, <clears throat> you know, uh, the the platform I usually use for doing online workshops is Big Blue Button, which mm. is an open source tool that was created for schools to use. And it's very much like Zoom, except there's a one one really big difference. There's no data being collected or sold. Hey. So, <laughs> um, yeah, that's it's really it's a really nice tool, and you can go to bigbluebutton.org and and use theirs. But it's open source, and oh. they encourage people to use that and put it on their own servers, and then you can do whatever you want with it. So a friend of mine put one on their server, and they let me use it. And with that one, anyone can join in without um, without logging in. And there's no software to download or install. <clears throat> it's really convenient. So I can just log in with a phone as well as my laptop. And now my phone is uh, a remote a remote camera, and I can use the front camera or the back one. And oh, nice! Get close ups. And um, yeah, and since I was doing so many online workshops, I bought a um, a document camera that. Um, oh is really yeah. Nice for, um, yeah. Anyways, it's all kind of uh, wrapped up right now, but anyways, <laughs> a there, uh, it works pretty well, and, and so that helps the technology. And then I use this software called OBS. I uh, can't remember what it stands for, but the BS is uh, Broadcast Studio, um, Open Broadcast Studio. Yeah, I think it is. So that allows me to use multiple cameras at once. Um, and then there's a virtual camera output that can go in. And I tried to use that for us today, but there's yeah. some incompatibility with uh, the service we're using. It's surprising. Um, yeah, I'm not sure because I've used it with Big Blue Button and Zoom and, and, and huh. others. I'm sorry that that happened, by the way. I love it when people can do more multi-camera yeah. stuff. Um, Technology. <laughs> yeah. So I guess in your workshops, you're not so much like looking at what other people are doing, as, or maybe they hold it up, but you're sort of doing your one-to-many kind of thing, maybe. Yeah. So it's if it's a, a really small workshop, everyone can keep their video on. But sometimes uh -huh. there's like 50 or 100 people well. um, uh, involved, depending on the event. And then uh, I, I ask everyone to keep their video and their audio muted. And when they have a question, they can type it in on the text and the chat. And then if there's something they want to show, because they're having problems, then they can turn their video on mm -hmm. and they can hold it up, and then I can see it, you know, kind of close up. And <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and and so it's really nice that um, you know to 
one of the things that's really important with uh, a workshop and just for human existence is having a feeling of connection. Yeah. And if if ever, if I'm just sitting here looking at a screen and seeing just myself talking and there's no feedback at all, I can kind of lose track of what's going on and, and I get spaced out. And, you know, and here we're talking. So even though it's just me on the screen now, I, I still have a feeling of a connection with you. And I know other people are listening and that's always in mind. And if I'm in a workshop, if I'm getting feedback through the text, then that helps a lot. And then if I have a, a volunteer who can alert me whenever, because uh, I can't necessarily always be looking at the questions, but it's really helpful to have a volunteer to tell me, hey, there's someone with a question. Why don't you look at the, the text or they'll just tell me what it is. And so there's back and forth. And then mm. afterwards, having people as, or not afterwards, during, throughout the whole thing, <clears throat> having people comment and asking questions and me answering that and having all this uh, discussion going on makes it at least give a sense that we're all in this together and not mm. just all alone at home staring at a screen. Yeah, I've been kind of panicking, minor plug. Uh, there's this live programming hacking session going on uh, in two days with Kitty Young, who's an amazing person, makes these uh, uh, Bluetooth flower brooches for wearable tech that you can hack. But I'm panicking a little bit because I'm trying to run it and there's going to be like nine, 10 plus people doing live broadcasting at the same time. And those are the people who are like going to be on screen and then we're going to be like having people join over text. <laughs> <laughs> just like panicking a bit about that but it really does bring a lot of that feeling of togetherness to the virtuality being able to like make stuff together and just like hang out in my own space making stuff while i'm talking to other people it, it's kind of incredible yeah it's really important <clears throat> and it's totally okay if you're freaking out and nervous you'll, you'll do <laughs> fine even though you're freaking out and nervous and uh yeah and you'll be glad you did i know you will do you still freak um, out at all when you're doing oh, workshops yeah. and things? I'm a, I'm an introverted geek, like uh, yeah. much, you know, with a few exceptions. Um, and so, uh, an introverted geek getting in front of a whole crowd of people and being the center of attention—that's total freak out every time. Mm. Um, but I've learned. I'm used to it. You know, I've been doing it now for um, since 2004. Wow. Doing TV Gone got me invited to to do all these things. Uh, I'd never, ever, ever, ever imagined I could do that before. But I'm used to doing what I do while freaking out. <laughs> that's beautiful. Oh, and that's uh, absolutely take that with me. <laughs> and uh, and it always is so rewarding as well. You get to do the thing, and then you feel like you've accomplished not only that thing, but also sort of conquering or not conquering, but like working with your own brain to to do the stuff. <laughs> yeah, it builds confidence, and um, you know, and that's the thing with with all the things that we do, and when we're helping each other, um, when someone is helped by you. Um, then they have a sense of confidence that they can do something they didn't know they could do before. And that carries through regardless of what they do with what they learned from you. Mm. I think that helps give us a, a framework of thing. being an introvert. Uh, and it helps to have these central things to talk about, I guess. Mm. Uh, it helps bring us together when we have a thing to look at. <laughs> uh, but especially when uh, you've made things like the TV Be Gone, that also has sort of a, a vibe of wanting to bring people together and not be so mediated by technology um, and focusing on each other. Would you like to speak a little bit about the background behind this? Yeah, so TV Be Gone came from me and some friends sitting around uh, we, and we, we hadn't seen each other in like three years and we got together in a, a Chinese restaurant in Palo Alto, California, uh, suburbia, Silly Valley. And, <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, and, and there was a TV on in the background and this was 1993 mm -hmm. when TVs in public places really didn't exist much. And it's hard to imagine that the world was like that at you know, looking around now, it's, they're everywhere. But back then, only bad Chinese restaurants had a TV. And it was in the corner. And we kept being distracted by it. And 
I, I kept telling myself, you know, like, stop looking at that thing. Uh, yeah. at your friends, pay attention to your friends. That's why you're here. And so anyways, I started mentioning that I was distracted by it and everyone else said they were too. And so that became a topic of discussion. And then that's when I came up with the idea. And another one of my friends said, yeah, the great name is TV Be Gone. And so uh -huh. that, that, was, that was lucky because it was a great name. And um, yeah, but it took me 10 years to find to make the time to actually uh, make the first prototype. And uh, I'm glad I did because it changed my life forever. Uh, there was a Wired article about it because uh, uh, someone I used to uh, volunteer with at the San Francisco Bicycle Coalition ah. was a journalism major and he needed a final project. And I was telling him about that while we're volunteering at the Bicycle Coalition. He says, oh, that could be a cool thing to do as a final project. And we had a great time doing the interview We'd go around and uh, and then he would turn the TV off and then he would say, that guy over there turned the TV off. What do you think about that? <laughs> And I'm like, uh, uh, what? Um, but anyways, it turned into a good article. He pitched it to Wired and they accepted it. And um, yeah, and my life's never been the same ever since. It's been, that's the one. That's October the one. 2004. Incredible. <clears throat> and yeah, that was the beginning of this uh, incarnation of my life. And, so, uh, uh, mm. so now there's this thing that you've just built that's kind of on the opposite side of that, which is where the TV is looking at you. Can mm. we talk about your recent lounge locker project? Yeah. So, you know, TV Be Gone, the reason why I put it out in the world is because I'm a total TV addict. Uh, time went away while I was watching TV every waking moment of my troubled childhood, trying to escape that trouble and um, mm -hmm. <laughs> failing, of course, like any other kind of addictive behavior. But um, uh, as an adult, I, I haven't had a TV since 1980, but as an adult wanting to get rid of that force for my life from public places uh, and then making it available to other people. And it's kind of like an art project in and of itself, a performance art project. And, you know, it's if I went, you know, to a public square and got on a soap box and said, you know, the, the evils of television, you should stop. Yeah. You know, and everyone would be like, who's this wacko? And um, now they I, I just put out TV Be Gone and they go, who's this wacko? But it's fun. Um, <laughs> It turns out it's fun to turn TVs off. It's more fun than turning them on. So people might even enjoy life more. Who knows? You know, so, um, uh, so Lounge Looker, uh, you know, I've been playing with technology all my life. I've been a geek since I was a little kid, you know, even before I was born, I think. But uh, um, I have been taking things apart. Like so much of us, when we were little kids, we took things apart and then learned to put them back together. And, and sometimes that we'd even work and sometimes we'd put them <laughs> together differently. And that's how we learn how to become hackers and, uh, repurposing things and sharing and all this cool stuff. Um, but, um, I have a very ambivalent relationship with technology. Uh, technology I think is super cool. Uh, we can do so much with it. It's very powerful. We can do amazing things. But so much of what technology is actually created for and used for is super negative. Mm. And everywhere, without exception, everywhere I've worked, uh, the technology was um, uh, used by the military for military purposes, which is not why I do what I do. That's mm. the opposite of why I do what I do. I, I do what I do to help people. And that's what I want to use my life energy for is to help people. And, and it's not up to me to decide how to help people. It's up to each of the individuals to take what I do and do something they think is cool with it. And the military doesn't exist for that purpose. It exists for yeah. killing, maiming, spying, mm. destroying. That's my way of looking at it anyways. And um, and yeah, so they've come along and wanted to use virtual reality and, and we didn't sell it to them, but they got one anyways through a university and they used it for a World War III training simulator. Great. You know? And like I put three months of my life in 1987 into creating this virtual reality system that got used to train people how to destroy like a third, two thirds of the planet. Wow. 
that's not why I did that. Um, you know, and, and there's so many examples uh, everywhere I've ever worked. And I've been a consultant, so I've worked in a lot of places. Um, the military comes along and wants to use it for something destructive. And uh, so, yeah, how can we use technology for making things better? Mm. You know, and that's a that's an important question we all have to ponder. So, um, Lounge Looker uh, is an attempt to explore this ambivalence for me. Uh, I love technology, and yet technology can be de so destructive. And the way into that was again not step getting on a soapbox and going to a town square and having people go, who's this wacko? Mm -hmm. But um, to have a fun way to explore that. So most people are into music of ver various forms. We like some music, we don't like others. Some forms of music, we like some and not so much some others in this realm. Mm -hmm. So for me, the the uh, I was invited to be an artist in residence at um, uh, the Museums Cartier in Vienna. And there's uh, this, this is kind of really fun, uh, wacky um, uh, art group called Monochrome. Mm. And that's run by a friend of mine um, who I met at uh, Chaos Congress a long time ago. And so he invited me finally to be artist in residence there. And if I wanted to, I could show my results at this conference called Robo Exotica, which is a conference, a real robotics conference, but it's all with a theme of lounges and cocktails. <laughs> So most of the robots mix cocktails, but I don't drink. <laughs> and uh, so I, <laughs> there's lots of pictures. I, um, I wanted to do something with a theme of lounges. So I thought, wow, lounge music, that'd be interesting. And I just that summer started learning Raspberry Pi for the first time. Oddly yeah. enough, that was the first time. And I, for the first time, also oddly enough, learning Python. And also Ooh. oddly enough, for the first time using Open CV, Open Computer Vision, a, a open source software package that can use um, uh, some pretty powerful tools for doing computer vision. And you can use a webcam and it can analyze what's going on. And you can use a little bit of uh, AI, machine learning to make patterns. And one of the things people have used this for is for pretty simple facial recognition. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, lounge, lounge music. I have an ambivalent relationship with lounge music. <laughs> I kind of hate it, but there's elements of it that are brilliant. And, you know, like it, it, it's, it exists primarily <clears throat> because there's uh, corporations that want to make money from it. So they hire a composer and they hire a lyricist and they hire musicians and they make this music to make money. And the Muzak Corporation is the primary really? example of this. And they, they play that music in elevators and shopping malls and uh, to try to get you to shop better and buy better. And, um, and yet all the people they hire, the composers, the lyricists, the musicians, et cetera, these are all very talented people in their field. So they pour themselves into what they're doing, even if the end result isn't what they would normally do. But they're being paid well to do it. So... Um, there's elements of brilliance in it. And some lounge songs are actually totally brilliant. Huh? And we've been emailing back and forth and you said, you know, you love certain songs. And, I actually kind of like Strangers in the Night, you know. <laughs> yeah, Strangers in the Night, you know, and it's it's hokey. And it's it, it's but, very but, hokey. But, but there's things like about it that, that key into, you know, we, we all have these fantasies of meeting people that we'll connect with for the rest of our lives. And especially since all the songs tell us that we're supposed to. And that oh, it's possible. yeah. That's and it is possible because we, you know, and we, people are random elements and we meet someone that's a random element that changes our life forever, like meeting totally. this guy uh, as a, a volunteer, as Bicycle, Bicycle Coalition volunteers, and he writes a story and my life is totally different, uh, you know, not romantically, but... Exactly, um, yeah, I want there to be more of those that are about, like, friendships that change your life, and, like, Strangers in the Night, we, you know, we ha shared a dance, and then we, like, went on to make a really cool thing together. <laughs> yeah, and, and our friends actually affect us much more and much longer than the so-called romantic relationships in our lives, which come and go for most people, and they're very, very intense, um, but 
often short-lived, but they change our lives too, and hopefully for the positive. And even if mm. we've had negative experiences with people, we learn from that and we all become better uh, and more capable as a result. So anyways, this is part of those lyrics, as hokey as they might be in some perspectives. And, and when I was putting this music into the Raspberry Pi, I had to do it note by note, and it gave me a, a, an even better appreciation for the composition of uh, these songs, including Strangers in the Night. Um, and, you know, but you mentioned your ambivalence with like Frank Sinatra. He's a total dick, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. And, and how and can I you even hear him without the big thing? That. It's so like, mm. yeah. But, you know, so, I know a lot of people love him. But there's these songs that he did and made popular that you wouldn't have known about without him. So, you know, there's, you know, even he, he's, a, he's got a great voice even if he's a dick. And so anyways, there's amb this ambivalence and it's very much the same with technology. These corporations do it only to profit in the next quarter, maximize the mm. profit every quarter, um, but they hire these brilliant people who are creative, intelligent, and sentient human beings. And we're pouring our heart and soul into this stuff. And so there's all sorts of brilliance in the tech, um, despite what uh, the end result often is. So you so, brought this into this project that ha combines your ambivalence about facial recognition and your ambivalence about lounge music. And I want to get to the the music that you've made for this is just wonderful. So you you go through this and it, what, it analyzes your face to figure out what uh, type of lounge music you or what you're looking for in life, what your greatest desire is in life. Is that right? Yeah, that's the, that's the promise anyways. For lounge <clears throat> music. Yeah, so like like any corporation, it, it's all self-serving, right? So they say, this is going to change the world, and we promise that the world is going to become a utopia, and they all lived happily ever after. Of course, the promise of technology always falls way short of what they deliver. Um, so, uh, so the promise of this exhibit is that we, who is this we? But we will analyze your face and calculate your innermost desires and then fulfill them by playing the best lounge music song possible for you right now. <laughs> That's incredible. <clears throat> yeah, and, and so it's, it tries to make it fun to make fun of and hopefully get people to think about these things that are pervasive in all of our lives now, everywhere we go, some places much more than others. And I love how it channels this concept that, you know, because they're co corporations, because they're pushing a specific product, they can say that they're going to, you know, they can actually analyze things and they can always like say that they're going to figure out things about you. And sometimes you can learn stuff about people through AI or whatever, but it's always going to present it to you in this end goal of like, you should buy this thing or that thing or that thing. And like the solution is always, buy one of our things it's never you can't like it won't like give you your raw data and be like okay now you know here's some cool stuff that you could look into like maybe you could think about meditating more or something <laughs> i don't know uh, yeah you know. right so the solution uh from the corporation is never going to be that you should stop paying attention to advertising yeah. and start doing things <laughs> and making time and exploring what you really love in your life and do that. <laughs> that's that's not going to happen. <laughs> There's another thing that I love uh, that you said specifically around the new year. Um, we always have this sort of push to make resolutions. And what I've done for the last few years is instead try and make a day, I call it grown up day, but whatever. Um, <laughs> where like, instead of telling myself that I'm going to force future me to try and like do these things, like being on the soapbox saying, you should do this. Uh, and like trying to shame people or like, you know, control them and, and corral them. Instead, uh, I like try and sit down and do a bunch of tasks that will make it easier to do the behaviors that I want in the new year. So like, you know, take care of, you know, what is taxes and like, how does my healthcare work and things like that. And these things that are big and terrifying and hard, but like I try to get up fancy, like dressed up fancy and like have a coffee or something, some kind of a nice tea or something. And uh, like, just, just do those things. And like, that way I'm going to be better able to do the things that I want to in the new year. And it feels like you're very much on the same wavelength around, uh, you know, enabling people to, uh, to have the lives that they want and to to do the things that they want in life uh with like the tv be gone and uh and the neurodreamer it's like i'm gonna help you 
accomplish the things or build the type of life that you want to have. And I think that's really beautiful. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's, I think, really important. We, um, we often don't give ourselves permission to explore what it is we really want in life. Mm. Um, we're not trained to do that. We're in many ways trained not to. And like throughout school, um, which we are uh, legally liable, <laughs> you know, we're required to go through school for at least 16 years, and many of us go through much more. And that trains us to absorb particular information that we parrot back and get rewarded for parroting that particular information back. And we don't have time to explore things that don't fit into that model. <clears throat> so what, uh, with all the things that I do, part of it at least, if not a big part, is to get people to pause and just question themselves and so that they can make time to explore what it might be that's really good for them. You know, again, I, I mentioned before, it's not up to me to decide what's good for anyone else. I've explored uh, a lot in my life and have found things that work for me. And if, other, if that can be an example for other people, either directly or indirectly, that's totally cool. But the main thing is we all need to explore and find out for ourselves. And, uh, and we can do that on our own. It's, it's much better since we're social creatures to have encouragement from others, you know, like in a hackerspace is a supportive community for doing just that. Yeah. <clears throat> but there are many other ways of doing that as well. And, you know, our, our network of friends, we can even if the workplace is uh, really cool, maybe the workplace can help do that as well. Unfortunately, the workplace is usually just a place for people to have hopefully not such a bad way to make enough money so we can pay for food and shelter and a few other things so that we can live at least a little bit of the life we want. Mm. But it'd be nice if the way we make <clears throat> money and other resources involved doing the things that we find meaningful and wonderful. And by doing those meaningful and wonderful things, we get enough of the resources so that we can keep doing that and keep exploring and finding other ways of doing that. And, um, you know, we're moving targets as long as we're alive, we're learning and growing mm -hmm. and we keep reevaluating. And we don't have to do that just once a year with New Year's resolutions. Yeah. Constantly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we help each other to do that as well. Like uh, we've been talking about hacker spaces, of course, noise bridge, all hands active. Yes. Uh, x -Hein that you've talked, is that how you say it, x -Hein or? Yeah, x -Hein cool and hackerspace Ghent, all these places are people sort of coming together outside of that framework of work to sort of co-make this i mean the, you, you can have all kinds of different interests and stuff not everyone is there to change the world but uh you know there is this really uh strong bent of people sort of really rethinking what do we want to spend time on how else could we um direct our time and what else can we teach and learn oh that's so good yeah, and how, how better to live our lives, because no matter where we are, we can always do better. And no matter how bad things are, we can always do better as well. Mm. Um, and and, and uh, it's not about, you know, changing the world as the goal, uh, but the world does change as we change. And mm. if we're exploring and doing, if each of us is exploring and doing more of what we truly love doing, that has an effect not only on ourselves, but uh, uh, with other people that we know and in our community. And if we're in a context of encouraging each other to explore and continually find things that are more meaningful for us to do with our time, then uh, we continually get better at living our lives, which has a big effect. And if we're doing that in a community and there's all sorts of problems in our lives, eventually we're going to hit on some things that address those problems. And again, we can do that on our own, but we can do that so much better with other people in an encouraging environment. Yeah. Um, this idea of we can always do better is also striking me. I'm looking to create a, a circuit board for Hackster for the next year and uh, just sort of for the new year. And, you know, I'm thinking about it and, one of the themes people suggested is sustainability. And of course it's kind of backwards, like to create, 
you know, we're, we're creating this technology, right? Uh, and sort of some of it will end up in landfills, some of it will, you know, use lead, some of it will be produced unsustainably. And this idea of like, we can always do better, I think is a huge part of that. So like, I'm, I'm looking forward to maybe creating um, with Jiva materials, which is this biodegradable PCB substrate. And there's all these things that we can explore that make that a little bit better and a little bit more aligned with where we want to go and where we want to take the future. And the power that we have to sort of drive that and share those ideas among each other with other people who care is just so powerful. Yeah, yeah, it's important. Yeah, there's trade-offs in everything. And, and when we do make, that's one of the things also on the negative side of technology, <clears throat> it's using um, all of these substances which are toxic and hopefully and, and now we're using much less toxic substances than before but still what do you do with these things after you're done with them they turn into toxic waste and um and like i, I think about that all the time especially before the pandemic when i'm traveling all over the world and flying all over the place mm, yeah is it worth doing that you know i'm i'm creating how much how many tons of carbon into the environment by flying you know on the one hand these planes are going anyways but i'm i'm but they can do that without me you know yeah, yeah, just like yeah. the military exists without me but they're going to they're definitely going to do that without me so mm -hmm. that's not really an excuse and you know and is the you know, how do you balance off sort of a social good, which I, I hope I've been doing with this physical bad, uh, environmental bad? Uh, I don't know. There's no easy answer for all that. And but I kept um, uh, trying to evaluate and reevaluate that. And the pandemic gave me a, a break from all of that and made me realize that I, it's time to travel less and do more here home uh, where I really love in Berlin <clears throat> and, um, you know, and, and hang out with my cat and friends here. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So excited that you have a cat. And, <clears throat> you know, that's almost one of the positive things to come out of this dreadful situation is that, like, now we're getting a lot of uh, advancement in telepresence and our ability to connect with people all around the world. Like, we're able to, we were already able to chat like this, but the fact that we've been doing it weekly is absolutely a function of having this be more normalized and the fact that people are tuning in and saying like you know i'm from the netherlands greetings from denmark you know it's it's Habitat. wonderful hey. it's so good um yeah and uh i want to share again some of the things that you've uh that we've put up here before we break off just so everyone knows where to follow you and things but i wondered if you have any last thoughts before we wrap up here and uh, you have these wonderful photos up of your Ars Electronica. This is what I was looking for earlier, all the robo exotic um, stuff and things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's some fun photos there. Everything I do is is open source, including my photos. And I've been taking photos uh -huh. since I was a little kid. So I'm I'm actually a pretty good photographer. They're really beautiful. Um, so uh, yeah, and they're all up there and they're all, one of the things I like about Flickr <laughs> through all their ups and downs and being bought and sold by Yahoo and all that stuff, but um, uh, is that by default, you can choose an open source license. So mine, mine oh. um, so use them any way you like. They're, oh yeah, look at this. Stuff, workshop stuff. There's thousands, tens of thousands of photos of people soldering. And there's also uh, uh, lots of people of all ages uh, doing workshops, but there's also street photography and post-industrial mm -hmm. photography and whatever, uh, architecture, landscapes. Um, lunches. <laughs> lunches, food. <laughs> <laughs> Food's important. Food's it a good is. thing. It's, it's one of the things we have to do that's wonderful. Mm. So, um, uh, yeah, I don't know. Last thoughts, uh, uh, you know, like uh, we, 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 I think the main theme throughout my life has been exploring how to choose, uh, you know, how to make choices. And we make choices whether mm. we're conscious of it or not. So what if we were a little more conscious of it? Not to always like be in our head, but you know, like what do, what do things feel like when we imagine making a choice? What does it feel like as we move into the future with that imagined choice? 
and uh, they can be big choices like um, you know quitting a job or um, you know going into or out of a relationship or they can be little choices like uh, what to eat for dinner or should I just go out and eat fries you know um, but they don't have to be like in our head like I said it's just like make choices <clears throat> out of all the infinite number of things to do right now you know you're listening to uh, me and Alex right so mm -hmm. um, could you be doing something more enjoyable? You know, if, if you can, then do it, you know, don't listen to us. But if you're enjoying this, then fine, that's cool. Um, but uh, we only have so much time in our life. It's very limited and, and whatever time goes away, it's gone forever and it will never come back. And, we, you know, I, I, I'm 64 right now and um, uh, tomorrow <laughs> I'm gonna be 65. But, wow, um, happy birthday. Thank you. Or, and, you know, uh, ambivalent birthday, however you feel about it. I, I'm fine. I, I usually don't think about birthdays. You know, it's like around the sun and around the sun and around the sun. Time keeps happening. But the main mm. thing is, what do we do with our time? We don't have any control over so much in our lives. We, we don't have control over certainly not what other people do, but we barely have control over what we do. We, we don't have control over what we feel. We, we don't really have control so much of what we think. But mm. we have a lot of control over what we choose to do. That's only up to each and every one of us only, although other people come into the picture and it's not always easy to make choices. Even if we know the right choice to do, it can sometimes be really, really scary or painful mm. to make that choice. But, um, you know, as we make choices, we have no control over the consequences of the choices, but uh, we can, if we choose to, learn from the consequences and 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 we learn now we have more information so maybe we can make better choices as time goes yeah. on so that's uh that's my version of hacking my life which is an ongoing project uh for as long as i'm alive and um yeah and and over time things slowly get better so for me every year of my life is better than the year before even when really terrible stuff happens like a pandemic or a friend dying or something really stressful happening. I'm just, you know, through all of the self-destructive behaviors of my uh, childhood and adolescent, I'm just thankful to be alive and feeling everything I feel, whether it feels shitty or great or whatever, I'm just thankful to be able to feel it all and learn from it and keep growing and keep living and keep doing whatever I do. <laughs> yes. And you make the world so much better for so many people like yourself mm -hmm. and others. Uh, we have all these people saying, you should come to the UK, come visit Canada. <laughs> you're always welcome in Copenhagen. And uh, everyone, is, ah, you're just such an amazing person. Thank you so much for joining me. I, it's so cool that it worked out that you're the last person I talked to this year on the uh, on the old cafe. But thanks again for joining us. And I hope you have you're a wonderful rest welcome. of your evening. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, the rest of my evening is going to be taken up with uh, finishing off the last of the hundred projects I have to judge for the PCB Way contest. Ooh, that sounds like a lot, but also very fun. <laughs> it's super cool. The 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 con the entries this year are some of them super sophisticated. It's pretty amazing. So it it's out. it's been fun. Um, yeah. So, anyways, thanks, and it's been good catching up in in this way. So yeah. it's been too long. Cool. And thank you, everyone, for joining. We'll hope to see you soon someday in real life. <laughs>